Madrid, it is said, is a behemoth. Noisy traffic, exhaust fumes and intense heat hover over the city. Refreshing ocean breezes blow over 400 kilometers away. Why should anyone go to Madrid when Spain calls with dream beaches in other locations? Because Madrid contradicts every prejudice. The metropolis is diverse, geographically fascinating, and surrounded by historical cities such as Toledo, the knife forge and old capital of Spain. Aranjuez Castle's snow-topped mountains, the windswept mancha with Don Quixote's windmills, and the king's residence, El Escorial, leave unforgettable impressions. Metropolis Madrid is best discovered on your own. Its charm lies in its contradictions, in the facets of the city's image. The sky over Madrid is almost always clear. There are around 200 sunny days each year. Extremely hot summers and cold winters determine the dry continental climate of the Castilic Plateau. Madrid has the highest elevation of any city in Europe, 650 meters above sea level. Over three million people live in the capital. Almost as many visitors pour in each year. There are many churches here, but no important cathedral as in Seville or Toledo. The city displays more modern architecture in contrast to its historical buildings. Fourteen kilometers an hour is the average speed of the more than one million cars in Madrid. At the wheel are usually young people, as 45% of all Madriders are under 30. The city expands for over 600 square kilometers. The residential area continues to stretch out into the surrounding areas. Madrid is Spain's political switchboard. It is the administrative capital, industrial center, a convention and conference city, and was Europe's cultural capital in 1992. Madrid is the geographic center of the Iberian Peninsula. It became the imperial capital which, in its golden age, rose to become a world power. The zero mile from which the distance on all Spanish roads is measured is the middle of the city on the Puerto del Sol. The starting point is directly in front of the regional government building. Here, in the time of the Moors, was the Eastern Gate, through which the sun could be seen to rise. The sun gate disappeared, the square Puerta del Sol remained and since the 19th century has become the center of the city. A stage for city life which does not even pay regard to siesta. Offices, stores, public transportation lead to the traffic center at which 10 streets come together. Even below ground, the Puerta del Sol is a traffic hub. Three important subway lines meet up here. The construction of Madrid's largest subway station influenced the entire layout of the square above. Entrances were placed below ground. As such, there was room for the pedestrian zone around the fountain in Puerta del Sol. In the heart of the city stands, of course, Madrid's patron animal, a female bear eating from a strawberry tree. 
the Puerta del Sol was the scene of important political events. Here, on the 2nd of May 1808, the resistance against French occupation broke out, and here the Second Republic was called to order in 1931. Philip III reminds one of the 17th century upon his horse as an absolute monarch, towering triumphantly above Plaza Mayor. The square exudes an introspective atmosphere. In the square and the arcades, there are inviting cafes and souvenir stores. There, souvenirs are sold which cultivate the city's image, such as small torero statues. Commerce plays an important role, but Plaza Mayor was really, as can be seen here, back when there were no arenas, a place where bullfights were held. A past about which few know today. An obvious relic of times gone by, however, is the mounted statue of Philip III. The Habsburg king relocated the court from Madrid to Valladolid in 1601, before Madrid's city fathers enticed him back with their 250,000 ducats. He then had Plaza Mayor created, which provided a beautiful backdrop for the events of the Golden Age now beginning. 100,000 inhabitants lived in Madrid back then. The simple population lived around the square, barbers, scissors sharpeners, craftsmen and salesmen. of the old city are still mostly poor. Those more wealthy preferred the Salamanca section in the east of the city. In the golden age, the inhabitants here were much worse off. They lived in fear and hunger. Beggars and cheats were everywhere. There was not a trace of the romance found in the old city today. Only the court held celebrations nearby, but they were unapproachable. Habsburgers promoted the arts. Philip IV brought the greatest painters and writers to the court. Diego Velasquez, Francesco de Zobaran, Lope de Vega, and Calderon de la Barca. It was they who made this period golden. It certainly wasn't the numerous gold and silver shops in the old city. They are much more recent, as are the blind lottery ticket sellers one sees everywhere in Madrid. The story of Madrid is documented in the Museo Municipal. Even the richly decorated Baroque door demands acclaim, a masterpiece by Pedro de Rivera. Originally, the settlement, unimportant up to the 9th century, was not called Madrid, but in Arabic, Marit, place of much water. On the east bank of the river Manzanares, the Moors built Alcazar in 860. The fortress was taken by the Castilian king Alphonse VI in the 11th century for the Christians. The city grew but remained insignificant. Only when the Habsburg Philip II made Alcazar his residence in 1561 did Madrid become the imperial city. Then many churches and monasteries sprung up and their towers dominated the city. When the Bourbon kings replaced the Habsburgs in the 18th century, French absolutism established itself. 
Charles III left an impression on the face of Madrid as no other had. As the so-called first and best mayor of the city, he had sewers and streetlights built. The most notable buildings were built during his reign. For example, the church San Francisco del Prado and the Royal Palace. In the early 19th century, Napoleon chased the Spanish royal family away. The hate of his foreign rule led to the War of Independence. On May the 2nd, 1808, the occupying forces killed many Madridas at Plaza Mayor and Retiro Park, a day which became a preferred theme for the Spanish spirit of resistance. A painting by Goya was retroactively given the name Dos de Mayo, even though it actually paid homage to Napoleon's brother. The city museum also shows the story of everyday life in Madrid, just as it is documented in numerous papers in the old city. The church San Pedro el Vallo is one of the many religious buildings in the southern part of the old city. The largest and most readily recognizable such building was San Francisco el Grande, whereas the provincial cathedral, San Isidro, is unimportant compared with Barcelona or Seville. As such, the church for the poverty-pledged order, San Francesco from the 18th century, was much more generously designed. Joseph Bonaparte wanted to rebuild the dome into a pantheon, but he was chased away beforehand. Earlier, lamb and oxen were tied to a post, slaughtered and dragged to the market on a leash. A bloody trail was left behind. In Spanish, Arrastro. This is how the most famous flea market in Madrid got its name. It takes place every Sunday in this quarter of the old city. In the triangle between the Ronda de Toledo, Cala de Toledo, and Cala de Embayadoras, everything can be found. Dolls, masks, mirrors, holy water basins, pistols, old nails, new jackets, and things which were stolen the previous Sunday. At the Rastro, of course, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, as miniatures, are a hit. Larger than life, they can be enjoyed in the Plaza de Espana. The Curayas, the old residence courtyards around the former slaughtering square, remain hidden from curious eyes. In every city, flea markets are among the tourist attractions. Take, for example, the Marché à Poussy in Paris. In contrast, the most famous flea market in Europe, Madrid's Rasto, comes across as being original. Rastro is living history of the city. Artists who painted the surrounding edifices thought the same way. Right next to El Rastro is Lavapiés Square. It reflects other squares in typical Spanish villages. There is no pomp or bronze statues. On the contrary, locals from the area populate the square. Lavapiés is more than just a square. Lavapiés is a city within Madrid. Flower pots hide the crumbling walls. The idyll is deceiving. No wall is so well preserved as this one. Small stores and bars. Housewives go shopping. Through narrow and unattractive, steep and uneven streets, they make their way home. Lavapiés does not draw crowds. It is not Madrid's picturesque Cartier Latin. Until 1492, after being brutally driven away by the Spanish king, Jews lived here. Lavapuest is Hebrew for place of the Jews and may have given the air its name. The Jewish quarter no longer exists, but Lavapiés has remained truly local. 
from Plaza de la Corrala, Tzatzuelas are performed in the summer. Operas for the average man, the songs might be called, which used to address current issues in the quarter. But who cares about that now? Today, television has soap operas and the whole world is in every bar. There are innumerable bars in Madrid. Everywhere the television is on and the melody of the gambling games can be heard. Ever since gambling, forbidden by Franco, has been legalized, hardly any Spaniard can resist for too long. It's a loud and boisterous scene the whole day through. Even in the morning, wine or beer is ordered here. And with them are tapas, small appetizers of various kinds. These are eaten constantly, despite the regular main meals. Eating well is one of the Spaniards' main aspects in life. It is then no surprise that Madrid has a ham museum. There, pieces of the exhibition can be consumed on the spot, after they have been appropriately appreciated. <laughs> Along with food and drink is music, which courses through their veins, the flamenco. first brought the flamenco to Spain. Old films from the archive of a flamenco school showed that at first it wasn't a dance, but a ritual dirge. It expressed the feelings and mental state of the guitanos. The guitar inspired the singer to new variations of the old theme. about much later. centuries the gypsies only perform their dances and songs amongst themselves. In Madrid, Seville, Barcelona, from Burgos to San Sebastian, this Spanish tradition was forbidden for a long time. Only at the end of the 18th century did this art form become known to the public. Madrid is one of the most important centers for flamenco, next to the Andalusian strongholds like Seville and Cadiz. different kind of tradition. 
the royal mounted bodyguards. They are on their way to the changing of the guard at the Palazzo Real, the king's palace in the west of the old city. The Habsburg king, Philip IV, who is responsible for Madrid blossoming artistically, the Siglo di Oro, stands as a proud horseman at the Plaza di Oriente, between the theatre and the king's palace. The late Baroque Palazzo Real, a square building with four wings, provides the absolutist rule with an architectonic expression. Right next to the palace is the cathedral, La Almudena. It is dedicated to the city's patron saint, but otherwise unimpressive. Many visitors pour through every day between the church and the palace in an effort to see the old center of power of the Spanish global empire. The most representative building in Madrid was designed by Giovanni Battista Sacchetti. It was commissioned by the first Bourbon king, Philip V, who did not like the old fortress of the Alcazar. When the often rebuilt fortress burned down in 1734, the grandeur of the French court was to be achieved. Palazzo Real was supposed to surpass its role model, Versailles. The majestic marble steps made by Francisco Sabatini led to the king's throne room. The hall is covered in immense tapestries. Large chandeliers illuminate the fine decorations. Today, the royal couple only sit upon the thrones for festival celebrations. A homage to the crown is the allegorical ceiling painting, the greatness of the Spanish monarchy with its provinces and states. The 26 by 11 meter fresco was created by two masters in the field, the Venetian Giovanni Battista Tiepolo and his son Domenico. Particularly impressive is the 43-meter high west side of the palace. It faces the Campo del Moro, its name going back to the former Moorish fortress. On the other side, towards the north in the direction of Plaza de Espana, are the Sabatini Gardens. They follow the patterns of French strictly geometric Baroque gardens. Francisco Sabatini was Carl III's favorite architect. Under his rule, the king's palace was completed, the gardens were made. They are a favorite meeting place for young and old, especially when it is over 100 degrees in the shade. The Plaza de Espana rises over the park to the old king's palace. The palace, in which Spanish monarchs resided until 1931, is in noticeable contrast with Madrid's modern face. This also includes the Bailén, the streets leading past the palace, one of the main arteries for the city's traffic. Across from the palace, Plaza de Oriente, is an oasis of peace and relaxation like other, so many other parks and green squares. Next to Plaza de Oriente is the Augustine Cloister, Real Monasterio de la Encarnación. It was sponsored by Philip III's wife and today contains a collection of relics and an art museum, which are strictly separated from the rooms of the nuns living there today.
Off of the axis of the Baleen, the Calamayor splits off further south. This connection between the king's residence and the Puerta del Sol was once the most important and finest street on which noblemen and courtiers lived. Today, the only thing that is exceptional is the rent for an apartment centrally located with good shopping. On the Cala Mayor is the market, Mercado de San Miguel. Its selection thrills locals and visitors alike. Cala Mayor was the birthplace of Lope de Vega, the most famous playwright of the Golden Age. He wrote more than 1,000 plays. Those interested can find out more at the information center in the town hall. The small, unassuming place could easily be overseen. But among guitarists, Senor Contreras is well known. In the back room, one of the most famous guitar makers builds his prized guitars for musicians around the world by hand, with much patience and years of experience. Every instrument is a work of art made of selected wood, each one signed and numbered. Artists come from all around the world in order to choose an instrument from the selection of valuable guitars. Back to the bustle of the metropolis, which, despite the chaos of traffic, does offer some shady places to pass the time. Plaza de Espana seems smaller than it really is because of the high-rise buildings. It is three times bigger than Plaza de Mayor. The Edificio de Espana from the Franco era is the setting for a Cervantes monument. It honors the creator of Don Quixote de la Mancha. Miguel de Cervantes helped the pitiful knight along with his squire Sancho Panza to eternal fame. Doggedly, Don Quixote charged at windmills across the plains of Mancha as he believed them to be attacking knights. The battle was useless, as was the fights by the Spanish Republic against revolting soldiers. These Franco supporters operated from a small barracks along the Plaza de Espana. In the civil war that follows, the Mandrills defended themselves for over two and a half years with many losses, though in the end, the Franco troops won. Don Quixote became a symbol of the resistance. The square became the center of Franco Spain. After the barracks were torn down, the square was redesigned. Since the 50s, high rise buildings have dominated Plaza de Espana. Today it is a place for relaxing, and after Plaza de Colón, it is the biggest square in Madrid. The 124-meter-high, 
Torre de Madrid can be conquered without effort in a minute with the elevator. Up on the 32nd floor, the cafe beckons with a grand panorama beneath it. If the Torre de Madrid affords a view over the oceans of streets, then the valleys between the buildings offer a new perspective. The grand boulevards of Madrid, this is the Gran Via, seems to visitors to be old, noble promenades. But by the time Parisians had long been strolling along the Champs-Élysées, Madrid still did not have a single showpiece. As early as 1886, city planners already had the controversial east-west lane straight through the city on their drawing boards. But first, alleys and homes had to be torn up before the Grand Via could be started in 1910. By the end of the 30s, the reconstruction reached the Plaza de España. The buildings were in accordance with the newest technical standards. Even now, the standard remains upheld. All along the Gran Via are digital clocks and thermometers, which make the normal, decorated clocks seem nostalgic. The architecture, which remains dedicated to being representative, uses Baroque and classical elements of style. The prestigious buildings have suffered from the glamour of their age, but even today, the Gran Via exudes its big city flair. An obligatory part of this is the never-ending traffic, big movie theatres and expensive clothes stores. Madrid is Spain's political capital and the centre for Spain's haute couture. Madrid in the evening, and the time of Movida begins. The time in which everything is set in motion. Traffic is still coursing, and everything is thrown into the evening's entertainment. Madrid is illuminated, and the metropolis makes for a splendid backdrop. Often in Madrid, the nighttime gathering points are marked by contrasts. Alongside the overflowing in clubs, there are quiet romantic squares like Plaza Santa Ana, in the old city where beer and tapas or a proper meal can be enjoyed in peace. <laughs> the Movida is an endless strip of bars, H.M. Ensberger appropriately wrote. A visit to the theatre provides for variety in the evening ritual, though it is preferred to arrange one's own entrance.
Such efforts, of course, call for reinforcements. For every sip, one nibbles on the appetizing tapas. Particularly picturesque are the so-called tile bars, with their imaginatively painted ajoyejos, Spanish for tile. Around Plaza Santa Ana, several compete for favor among the visitors and for recognition of the most beautiful and funniest portrayals. Enjoying yourself is the unanimously accepted motto. To the end of all physical limits, night is turned into day. Madrid me mata, Madrid is killing me. Grown some who, in the night before, were caught up in the tide of the metropolis. In that case, one should combat the hangover with a strong black coffee in one of the traditional cafes. So-called tertulia cafes, such as El Espejo or Café Guijon, are only two of the notable meeting places in which tertulias or conversations on various topics take place. Everywhere in the city, not only here on the Paseo de Recoletos, cafes wait for the night birds and for those who are taking their first breaks of the day. In the immediate area is the Plaza de las Sibelis, named after the fountain of the same name. Charles III gave the commission a wagon pulled by two strong lions with Kibeli, the goddess of fertility, and the great mother of all the gods. Swarmed by the traffic from the busiest streets, which cross here stands Sibelius before the imposing ornate post office from 1918, which is often ironically called the Cathedral of Communication. From here, the Paseo del Prado stretches out southwards and was once strolled upon by the Habsburgs. Later, the Bourbon Charles III had it expanded to a beautiful promenade with fountains and trees. Along the impressive boulevard, are traditional elite hotels such as the Palace Hotel or near the Prado, the Ritz Hotel. Between the Ritz and Prado Museum is a statue of the painter Goya. A million visitors pour into the world's largest exhibition of paintings each year to see his work and that of other famous Spanish painters. The classical building was planned as a museum of natural science at the end of the 18th century, before it presented the royal collection of paintings in 1819. In front of the main edifice of the building, symmetrical along its axis, towers Spain's most important painter prince, Diego Velasquez. On the Plaza de Morillo, south of the Prado, stands the third member of the triumvirate of Spanish painters, Bartolomé Esteban Morello. He is one of the most important representatives of the Seville School of Painting. Of the 5,000 works in the Prado, these are the most important. Here, Hieronymus Bosch created his Garden of Desire, a mysterious major work of the late Middle Ages. He painted the triptych around 1500 at the height of his creativity. 
With wild imagination, he created innumerable figures and scenes. The nobleman with hand on breast, one of El Greco's best portraits, shows a proud caballero. Goya's painting, May the 3rd, 1808, which depicts the shooting of the Spanish resistance, is full of drama. The parasol first brought attention to Goya. His fame, however, is due in particular to two pieces, the clothed and the naked Maya. At the age of 30, Velasquez painted the triumph of Bacchus before he completed the Prado's most famous picture three years later, Las Meninas, the Noble Maid. The infant Margarita is at the middle of the picture, escorted by dwarves and ladies of the court. The royal couple can be seen in the mirror while Velasquez paints their portrait. East of the Prado, on the way to the Retiro Park, lies the Casón del Buen Retiro. Formerly a dance and reception hall, today it is part of the Prado and contains Spanish paintings of the 19th century behind its neoclassical edifice. Following a visit to the museum, one need only cross the street Alphonse XII in order to relax in a park on the other side. To retire, just as simply, the name can be explained, Retiro Park. This green oasis covers 120 square hectares in the east of the city. At the start of the 17th century, Philip IV had added this enormous park to his summer residence, Buen Retiro, outside of Madrid city limits. There, the court enjoyed its free time when it became tired of administration work. Common people were not allowed entry. This changed when Charles III, the educated reformer king, opened the park to the public in 1767. With one stipulation, every visitor must be washed and well-dressed. Today, they are not so strict. Those looking to relax from the well-to-do quarter Salamanca are among the best dressed anyway. Nonetheless, Today, anyone may enjoy the gushing fountains. The artificial lake is at the center of the park. Its eastern shore is decorated by the mounted monument of Alphonse XII. Architectural attractions include the Palacio de Valesquez, a brick building from 1883 with ceramic decorations, and especially the neighboring Crystal Palace. The iron and glass construction was also built at the end of the 19th century. It originally served to exhibit flowers. Today, the Palacio di Cristal presents modern art. A little lake in front of the palace is the setting for outdoor classical concerts. Jazz and rock fans, on the other hand, make their way to the bigger lake. The tradition of the park goes back to the Catholic Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, who enjoyed walks through the gardens of Hieronymus Cloister. It was destroyed by Napoleon's troops. Only the church between Retiro Park and Prado remained. It's one of the oldest remaining places of worship in Madrid, and in 1975, Juan Carlos was crowned there. A 
At the south end of the Paseo del Prado is the Botanical Garden. Again, the city planners and the progressive king, Charles III, had the park made in order to promote research in the natural sciences. Today, discoveries of a literary nature may be found there. In unique stores, bibliophiles can hunt for rarities. Some lucky hunters sometimes find an old edition of Cervantes' Don Quixote. The Botanical Gardens borders on the Plaza del Emperado Carlos V. It brings together Sibelius Square in the north and the Prado Boulevard to the south. Two buildings dominate the square. Huge bronze statues draw attention to the Ministry of Agriculture. On the other side is the impressive Estación Atocha, the train station from the year 1892. In the 27 meter high and 152 meter long hall, there are no longer any trains. In 1992, the old hall was redesigned to be a palm garden. The new train station can be reached by escalator. The high-speed trains on the madrid Seville line stop here. Nearby, an 18th century hospital was renovated to be the most important center for modern art. The Centro de Arte Reina Sofia is to be the Prado for the 20th century. Inside the square building with a garden courtyard are over 40,000 square meters of exhibition space displaying the works of Spain's modern artists like Picasso, Miro, Dali, Tapies. The Sophie Du also displays works by contemporary artists. The Franco dictatorship did not approve of most Spanish modern artists. As such, their works were spread throughout the museums of the world. One painting was reacquired and is now the centerpiece of the collection, Guernica by Pablo Picasso. This outcry against war depicts the total destruction of the Basque city Guernica in 1937. Franco's massacre of civilians was supported by the German Air Force. In a few weeks, Picasso made this outcry for the World's Fair in Paris. For decades, this piece was in the New York Museum of Modern Art. In accordance with Picasso's will, it returned to Spain after the Franco era. The Centro de Arte Reina Sofia and the Prado make the Paseo del Prado a museum mile through all epochs of art. The boulevard continues on into the north of Madrid. We pass Palazzo di Via Hermosa, the Naval Museum, and the Sibelis Fountain to the Paseo del Recoletos. Of the 50 museums which truly make Madrid a cultural capital, several are still on the boulevard. For example, the Archaeological Museum and the National Library. They are both in a building which was begun in 1866. Queen Isabella II laid the cornerstone of this temple of science. With four million volumes, the library was used for studying purposes. An imposing staircase leads to the huge building. The archaeological collection presents prehistoric, Iberian and classical artifacts. 
The museum's multifaceted nature can be seen in the arts and crafts from the Middle Ages through to the 19th century. Among the most important pieces is the Lady from Elche. The limestone sculpture from the 5th century BC may be a goddess of death. The archaeological National Museum is next to the Plaza de Colón, the largest square in the city. Four monolithic blocks recall the golden age of Spain's global power in the Gardens of Discovering America. The highest honor and a monument naturally go to the seamen from Genoa, the discoverer Cristoforo Colombo. He served the Spanish court. Cristobal Colón, Spanish for Columbus, stands on a neo-Gothic plinth and looks from the square down onto the city. With numerous letters, Columbus tried for seven years to gain support for his idea in Portugal to look for a western passage to India, without success. The Catholic monarchs of Spain granted him the opportunity. Ferdinand and Isabella equipped him with three ships, the Nina, Pinta and Santa Maria. On the 12th of October, 1492, Columbus stepped onto the newly discovered land he thought to be India. His four trips brought him fame and fortune to the Castilian kingdom. The discovery of America and the natives Columbus called Indians changed the development of world history decisively. The promises made to him by the court were largely not kept. Columbus died disappointed and upset. From Columbus Square, the Catalana continues, a seemingly never-ending city highway which splits Madrid north and south in two. It is a direct extension of the Paseos in the south and leads to modern Madrid with its skyscraper backdrop. Most famous skyscrapers are Torre Picasso, Torre Europa, and Torre Solube. There is a whole world between the buildings of glass and steel in old Madrid. Here one can be of two minds, just as with the phenomenon of bullfights. Here there are only absolute supporters, aficionados, or absolute opponents. But there are not many opponents. Madrid is, next to Seville, a stronghold of the Corridas. One of its stars, Torero Ortega Cano, presents his point of view. Sí, la muerte, la muerte, todos sabemos que está ahí, ¿no? pero eh, somos cobardes y queremos ocultarnos. ¿no? We know that death exists, says Ortega Cano, but we are cowardly and want to hide. Death finds us anyway. A Torero is closer to it than other people. If you put on Torero clothes, you look in the mirror and test yourself. You take your own confession and you know death is there. The most important thing regarding fear and death is that you fight it. I say, don't come too close, I can handle you. I say that every day that I go out to a bullfight and leave my house. Y se lo digo los días que cada día que me levanto de mi casa para salir a la calle. Outside of Spain, with the exception of Latin America, bullfights are not accepted. 
Even in Spain, animal right activists support ending the bloody spectacle. What does the Matador Cano have to say to these protests? Y como torero, que hay mucha gente que está en contra de la fiesta de los toros as a Spaniard and a torero, he says, I believe that many are against it because they don't know the real reason for it. The meaning of the existence of the steer, the mysticism of the torero, the artistic enrichment provided by bullfighting. I cannot be against it if I don't know it. The fighting steer is a noble creature. It continues to fight gallantly, even after it has been punished by the picador's lances. No other animal fights so chivalrously with an easy way out. The bullfight is also a native Spanish festival, which is also enjoyed in many other countries. The corrida begins every Sunday, though not in winter, at exactly 5 p.m in midsummer at 6 p.m. The bullfight is the only event in Spain which begins punctually. In the greatest arena in Spain, Las Ventas, over 20,000 aficionados cheer their heroes. Stars like Ortega Cano, or formerly El Cordobes, earn vast sums for each show. The game with death does draw the young. Seven-year-olds learn at bullfighting school even though the corrida sometimes has a deadly end. Then two die, the torero and the mother of the victorious steer. Such is the tradition. Tradition and modernity, metropolis and Spanish village, cultural capital of Europe, stronghold of bullfighting, flamenco, traffic chaos, and the ocean is 400 kilometers away, so why go to Madrid? Because this mix is matched nowhere in the world.